You know, I am really excited about what God is doing in our church. I, I really am. Uh, you know, I, I look around, and uh, as some of you know, I'm a sectional presbyter, and uh, help to oversee 17 other churches. Not that I'm the pastor there, but I'm kind of a pastor to pastors, if that makes sense, and uh, just help out in different needs. And I am so blessed to be pastor here at First Assembly of God. Uh, really, I am. When I go around and I meet with different pastors and I hear some of the things that are going on uh, in the church and whatever, and, and don't think that I'm feeding you things to pick up on, that you need to do this. But uh, some of the problems that they have to face and deal with and whatever, I, I just get on my knees daily and say, thank you, Lord, that that's not happening at First Assembly, that we are a body of believers that is joined together in unity in love and in, in ministering to the needs of our community and to the world. And thank you, God, for what you've enabled us to do over the past 26 years. And should the Lord tarry, how many, how many know, you know God's going to continue to bless and move? And even when we've come and gone, the church is going to continue on if it's been laid on the right foundation. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. It's all about him. Well, one of the things that I'm really thrilled about is the fact that uh, because of us having the building paid off, in just a couple of months, we're going to be able to take on full-time a fellow who's been working here part-time, but you would think he was working full-time for the past 10 years as leader of our youth, and he's also worked some with young adults, and uh, he's just done a fantastic job. He and his wife, Trina, have raised up leadership. Uh, I, I know my daughter, Kirsten, just thinks he walks on water, um, you know, and uh, the only problem is he keeps sinking, she tells me, so I don't know what, but in all seriousness, uh, Trevor has just done a fantastic job. He's not only a friend, but he's a fellow colleague. He's a, he's a young man who loves God. He's a young man who loves people. And his heart and his passion for the lost is just, uh, you know, exemplary. And uh, he has just raised up a lot of uh, fantastic youth leaders over the years as well. And uh, I've asked him if he would share this morning. Uh, I'd like to give him an opportunity to, um, you know, to speak from time to time. And uh, I always look forward to what the Lord has laid upon his heart. So could you just give a warm welcome today to Brother Trevor Wetzel. God bless you, Trevor, as you come and share what God's laid on your heart. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. I really appreciate that. Um, it's all because of the glory of God. Can we say amen? amen. No, nothing's possible without God, but with him, all things are possible. And it's just an honor and a privilege. Uh, we have an amazing, amazing church here. I, I appreciate so many of you that uh, always encourage me. Uh, even before church this morning, when I came in, Billy was encouraging me. Uh, he and I started, the, basically, we joined the church the same day. Uh, so we have a connection, and we've been involved in several uh, uh, outreach opportunities and things together. And, you know, it's amazing how God just moves in our midst. Amen? You know, I, I look back. Back 10 years ago and I think I didn't know anything and I look now and I'm thinking thinking I still don't know anything God still is the one in control and God is the one who leads everything I've ever done uh, I, I look back and think you know God without you I would have fell on my face so many times and I've done that because I tried to do it my way amen and God is so faithful in that and I've asked a few students this morning if they would come help me uh, help me out Larissa I mean I'm sorry Lorema and Teddy your sisters, Larissa. But I asked uh, Lorema and Teddy if they would come help me this morning with my sermon. Teddy's going to pray, and uh, Lorema's going to read first uh, some scripture. Um, I told her I'm getting too old to see the paper, so she said she would help me out this morning. Here, I'll take the bottom too. Here, you need this. I'll hold it. Okay, she's going to read from Zephaniah. Zephaniah. It should be on the PowerPoint. It is. The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Jeladiah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utter con utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds in the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along, the for, along with the wicked. I will cut off a man from the face of the land, said the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against the, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the hosts of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned their back on following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. 
And it shall come to pass that in the time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will do no good, nor will he do evil. Therefore the goods shall become booty and their houses a desolation. They shall build the houses and not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near and is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There are might, mighty men shall cry out. The day, of day is a day of wrath and a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall poured out and be poured out in the dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by fire and his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O de undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice, Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will, will be well hidden in the days of the Lord's anger. Go ahead, Daddy. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful blessed day you've given unto us and that we may assemble for you, Father. I thank you, Lord, for letting us have your Son, Lord, who died for us, for saving us from this wrath, O oh, Father God, and you've blessed us, Father, with your Son's blood. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will... Your Holy Spirit, Father, will guide our tongues, Father, to speak of you, Father God. For our words cannot penetrate, but your words can penetrate deeply, O oh Father. Yes. I thank you for this wonderful, blessed day, Father, again. Lord, without you, Lord, we cannot do anything, Lord. We are nothing without you, Lord, but with you are everything. And I pray, Father God, Lord, you help us today. Help us understand your word, Lord, and let it penetrate our hearts, Lord. Father, yes, we may Lord. know your name. And Father God, we may do unto what you've called us to do. Lord, we may do your will, Father, for your will is great and wonderful. And I thank you for everything you've given unto us again. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Teddy, and thank you, Lorema. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. You know, as I was reading through uh, Zephaniah, I was actually preparing a sermon a little bit different. And it was just amazing how God, I'm taking these off because I can't read the paper without the, with them on, but I can see you better. But, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what I was going to preach on this morning, and it, it just kept coming to me uh, as I heard the news of the week. Of course, some of you, uh, some of the things that have been coming across the news, and it just troubles me in my spirit. Anyone that's a Christian, anyone that believes that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, anyone that is a Bible believer, when you see the things that are transpiring, you just can't help but just get sick in, in your spirit and you feel like just melting into the, into the ground beneath you. It's just, uh, I just, it just hurts me spiritually to see the things that we are allowing to happen, not us, but our country is allowing to happen. And if you read the scripture of Zephaniah, he was a prophet who lived around the 7th century BC. He was a great-grandson of King Hezekiah, and there is evidence that he prophesied when King Josiah, who was the king of Judah in the century, just before there was a great uh, revival in 621 BC. In his writings, he says, in the, when the word of the Lord came to him uh, with regards to the future of Judah, because they had sinned against the Lord. He was talking about, you know, when Lorema was reading about the things that would transpire, about how God's wrath would come up on them. And I know you, we, need, we hear these sermons, you know, a lot of times you hear, you call them Bible thumpers. When I grew up, let me tell you, it came fire, hell, and brimstone every Sunday. How many remember those sermons? Every Sunday I would walk into church, I would walk out scared to death that God was going to burn me and kill me right there. That's exactly the kind of, of sermons that I listened to as a, as a young man. And some of them, I would walk out, oh God, he hates me. But God doesn't hate us. He loves us, but he gives us warning signs and, and gives us things to go by and says, th these are the things that are going to happen. And through Zephaniah, he was saying that exact thing because of the word of the Lord came to him. It sounds pretty harsh from a God who loves us and your people say it all the time. 
They say, well, why would God do that if he loves us? You know, how many of you have heard that before? But see, God has already, he loves you because you are his creation. He has created you to live for him here on this earth for him. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. What happens is he gives you free will. How many like free will? You have the choice to decide whether you're gonna honor God and follow him or you have the choice if you're going to reject him and not follow him, right? So that's, it. that's the choice he gave us. Can you imagine if he says, you're gonna follow me no matter what? See, that would be boring and, and everybody would do the same thing, but God gives us a free choice. You see, I feel that we are in a state, the same state as Judah in our nation. Today, with the, our country, the United States of America, which was founded on godly principles and godly morals, uh, it just it boggles my mind to look back 30 plus years and think how much our country has changed and how our morals have d decayed into what they have. Uh, I had the opportunity, and listen, I'm not advocating Facebook. That's not what I'm advocating. Everybody knows Facebook is evil, right? We all know that. But, but a friend of mine who, who I'm not sure if he's serving the Lord, I'm not sure if he does or does not. He's a truck driver. I knew him when he was a young man, and he friended me on Facebook years ago. He posted a blog about what transpired this week with, you know, uh, uh, with the uh, adoption of allowing homosexuals to be married. And he, he blogged something in regards to that. So I, I've read 70 plus blogs of people who had an opinion, okay? So I'm like, man, that's a lot of blogs. This is getting a lot of hits. This must be pretty good. So I start reading it. And of course, you know, it's the same old analogy. Some people had a clue and some people didn't have a clue. Some people were just out in left field because they really don't know. They really don't know the facts. So basically I, I blogged in and said, uh, attention everyone. It, it didn't say that. I just basically said, uh, just for your information, the state of Virginia did not adopt that, that a, that a uh, Supreme Court uh, judge actually overturned it as un unconstitutional and said, you can do it. Even though 57, I think I saw one of Brad's blogs that he had posted that 57% of, or 58% of Virginia voted against it. And, and, and I said, just so you know, and my only question was, is why, if we are Bible believe, if we're a Bible believing nation and we were founded on that, why have we changed our position? Why have we changed over the years? And, and, and all of a sudden, and, and I said, our country is based on that. And some other person comes in and starts blogging, you know, we're not, we've fallen away. And, and, and it goes on and goes on and goes on. So, you know, we have replaced uh, all of this, you know, this fearing of God and how we feel, how we serve God as a nation. We've replaced it with complacency. We've replaced it with sin. Our situations, it seems like every time I turn on the TV or listen to the radio or I let, read the newspaper, it gets worse with every passing day. Now, some people would say, well, you depends on what station you're watching, right? If you're watching Fox News or if you're watching CNN or if you're watching uh, WHSV TV3, it may be different. Or if you're reading uh, different magazines. Uh, I try to read a lot of stuff, uh, to be honest with you, sometimes I read stuff that Brother Bill sends me. I read things, you know, that, that and I know people like Brad will post, people I trust and I know that they are God-fearing people. You know, they are follow the word of God to the, to the kilt and they're not just off in left field making things up. And we know that that happens. You see, so with all these things going on, sin, we have incurable diseases that are going around. We have super storms that are bigger than we've ever seen in the history. How many uh, were watching the news? There was a super storm, a typhoon that hit Japan, I believe even yesterday morning. Um, uh, we have enemies that wanna kill us as Americans just because we're Americans. And there's people that wanna kill us because we are Christians. They think that we are, you know, uh, we are to be killed because we believe in Jesus Christ. The persecution of the church has started even in our nation, if you go to other nations, if you read, there are people that are in prison in other countries because they are followers of Jesus. They are put in prison because they just believe something. Can you imagine if, if I said the Pittsburgh Steelers are the team that I don't like, although I don't dislike them, that's Dallas. But if I said I didn't like the Pittsburgh Steelers and I said the people that like Pittsburgh have to go to jail, that means Pastor Jeff and little Schuyler would have to go to jail today because they have, you know, I know Jeff loves Pittsburgh because I gave him a, a Pittsburgh Steelers hard hat and he talks about it all the time. He and Zach and of course, little Schuyler has on the, the outfit. But can you imagine if you were put in jail just because you believed in something? I mean, that is persecution at its right 101. 
Standards that meet the devil's expectations are what we are seeing. And we continue to play follow the leader. I'm not meaning us as individuals, I'm meaning our nation. The Pied Piper, or the Pied Piper, if you know the story, who was leading the children, is leading, you know, our, you know playing the pipe, and, we're, and our nation is just following along. We're like getting in line like zombies, and we're just following along. We're playing follow the leader. How many remember that as a kid? But do not fear. But do not fear, it's all biblical. It may not specifically spell it out in exact words like that, but it is biblical. It's biblical that this would happen. If you read in 2 Thessalonians, and it's amazing, Brother Bill, I was reading, I was putting my sermon together, and I, I, I literally was done. I was literally pretty much done, and I was like, uh, when you look at a paper for five to seven hours straight, and you're typing, and you're, you're reading, and you're looking things up in the Bible, and you're, you know, I've got two iPads laying out in my, uh, my uh, one of my other Bibles, in my King James, New King James Version Bible, and I've got all this laying out there, and I'm studying. After a while, you get a little tired. Your eyes get tired, especially when you can't see. So I'm like, you know, I was, and I saw a blog that Bill had, Bill had linked to it. And I was like, wow. I mean, it was almost, I was like, th th that's what I'm going to be talking about. I was like, I, I hope Bill didn't like copy my notes or, or maybe he's, you know, pulling something out. It was just coincidence. Amen. I mean, he, he, he's the, he can tell you, he blogged it. He linked it or somehow I just saw it. Maybe, maybe Cindy did, uh, but I saw it. And, and it talks about, you know, basically the same thing I'm about to read into. It is biblical. And if someone's talking about the, the new moon or the, or the blood moon uh, doing that in one of your classes. I think it was with the Millers. I want you to follow with me in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by the word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, or partition. Or who is that? I mean, what, what, isn't that what's going on right now? It will be revealed when there's a great falling away. We are seeing that. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to make a prediction here because heaven knows uh, I'm in a, uh, we have a, the kids in the youth group, some of us and the leaders have a football poll and we like pick games. We didn't bet on it or anything. We just have football games. And I'm like, I think I'm like second to last now after last week, but I'm not really good at predicting that kind of stuff. So I'm not trying to make a prediction. Uh, I'm really bad at it, but I feel that we are seeing things line up for our last days. Maybe it's sooner than we actually believe or think. Anyone see the blood, the blood moon? Anybody have the opportunity? I was up that morning and you know what's amazing? I was so locked into work. I get to work and I start seeing people blog all these, you know, when my phone starts dinging and I see where people are posting pictures of it. And, and again, I'm not making predictions, but Peter preached, you know, in Acts 2, he was talking about, he said, I, you know, when he was preaching there, he said, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not saying that the moon was actually made of blood. That's not what I'm saying. But it's coincidence, you know, it's too coincidental that it looked, it looked like blood. That's what they called it was the blood moon. Now, am I trying to say I'm a scholar and I know all the answers? I don't. I don't. There are people out there that do that. That is not me. I've not studied into it enough. We may be on the brink of the great return of Jesus Christ. The signs are out there. They're being put into place. The scripture is coming true. It's, it's like being laid out. It's like a, a blanket being laid out with no wrinkles. And it's like, wow, that's amazing how, how it's coming true. And we are sitting back watching it happen right before our own eyes. If you, if you read in scripture, when Jesus was standing before the scribes and the Pharisees, what's one thing about the scribes and the Pharisees? They were blind because they didn't even know that Jesus was God. They didn't even realize that he was the one. He was the son of God and they missed it. It's like they were blinded by the, but you know, they were just totally blind. And I don't want that to happen to our church in this day and in this hour. I believe that we need to hear the real truth about what is going to happen in our, in our country in our nation and in this world. It's going to happen. These things are going to take place. 
And we're not to be, it says, do not be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter. When we were reading about Zephaniah, you know, I, I just kept reading that. I was like, Lord, how in the world did I stumble on that scripture? How did I find that? There's no way in this world unless God was like, hey, uh, go there. Literally, I was reading my iPad. I have a Bible app on my iPad. I was like, God, I really need something to tie into this lesson. And I was like, true, Zephaniah. I clicked it, boom, it jumped up. That is God. That is not me making it up. You're like, that's just coincidental. No, it's not. It's God is right on time. God always has a plan. I called Pastor Jeff on Thursday. I said, Pastor, I probably had the worst day of my life. Did I not tell you that, Pastor Jeff? I said, this has been a terrible day. It's been really tough. I had a lot of things going on. Had a lot of things coming against me. Just things were not flowing the way I felt they should. And I thought, you know, God, why is this happening to me? I was like, had a pity party. You ever have a pity party? And then I had to complain about it. You know, I had to go through the whole process of, of whining and complaining. And I, I did all that. Anybody else do that? Oh, it's just me? Oh, one honest, two honest, three honest people. Okay, I'm glad there's three of you that I don't have to pray for later. But it's amazing how God just shows up right on time. And I sit down on Friday night and I sit down and I went, ah, I fell asleep and I woke up at about 10, no, maybe eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. I'd fallen asleep. I was extremely tired. And I woke up and I felt refreshed. And I just said, God, thank you for that sleep. And my wife God bless her. She went on uh, up to my, my sister-in-law's. My niece turned seven. Can you imagine turning seven again? But she went up there to see, uh, see them. And, and on Friday night, I, I studied my word. And, and then Tanner came home at about 10 from work. And, and it, it was just amazing how God opened up that door. And yesterday, it was just, I was at peace. I was just at peace how God was just letting me write this sermon and put it together. You know, we may be on the brink of Jesus' return. I know we've heard that since we were kids. How many of you heard that? We've all heard it. But I just want to re rehearse in your memory. If you read into Matthew 23, 3 through 14, also Luke 21, 7 through 19, they basically are talking about the same things. And it says that and, and it, Jesus here is on the Mount of Olives, and it says, Now he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when we will, these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of this age or the age? And Jesus answered and said, and it's in red, so he said it. It said, take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars so, so, that, you, so that you are not troubled. Uh, see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kings, kingdoms against kingdoms and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up in uh, tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures till the end shall shall be saved and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then to the end, the end will come. Thank you, Jenny, for traveling to the Philippines and taking the word of God there. Thank you to our missionaries that are out on the missions field all over this great world, all over this uh, entire planet, preaching and teaching the word of God to people that otherwise may not have the opportunity to hear it. But you know, we have taken the gospel to every corner of the planet. When it started even back in, in, in biblical times, when you read when the disciples were following Jesus and Jesus passed, you know, died and, and was resurrected and ascended into heaven from that moment on and the church began and Paul was, was walking around in, in, in that part of the world in the Middle East and over into Rome and he was preaching the gospel and planting seeds all over and the church started and Peter was preaching and the church began. It's not hard to see that God is setting the stage for the re his return of Jesus. He is laying things out. I have heard it, uh, of course, many times, just like you from when I was little, that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Don't forget, I remember that kid, pastors slapping their hand, Jesus is coming. How many remember that as a kid? Jesus is coming. 
And we, we, you know, I can just remember as a, as a young man hearing that. And, and if you read in Thessalon, 1 Thessalonians, and I told pastor, I have a lot of scripture. I don't want to wear you out with scripture. But pastor said, I don't think there's a such thing as too much uh, scripture. So I'm, he, I, he's got my back. So be mad at him today. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others have, have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we should, even so God will bring him uh, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Teddy, we're gonna meet the Lord in the air. Mitchell, we're gonna meet the Lord in the air. Diana, we're gonna meet Jesus face to face in the air. Can you imagine that day when we stand and we're like, wow, this is amazing. And we get to, like, I can't wait to float past the planets. Like, I'm like, you know, that's like, wow, Saturn's really cool. You know, and we always see like the Hubble spacecraft sent back pictures, but no way a picture can, or, or can, can match the realness of what we're going to see. Can you imagine? We got to be watching. One of my points today is being watching. If you read in scripture, and I won't read all the way through it, but I'll, I'll go through it a little bit, but we need to be watching, we need to be looking, and we need to be listening because Jesus is coming for his bride. He's coming for the church, and we need to be watching, looking, and listening for him. If you read in Luke 12, 35 through 40, and I'll read some of it. It said, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourself be like a man who waits for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks at the door may be open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes, he will find watching. Blessed are the ones that will be watching for his return. And you know, that's the, that, I mean, that's the, that's our hope is when Jesus returns, we get to meet him in the air. If not by the grave, if we're still here who are alive and remain, we will meet him in the air. When I was a, when I was a young man, I had a, I got a really funny story if I can, if you'll entertain me for a second. When I was a young man, I was probably seven, eight, maybe nine years old. My dad wanted to teach me how to deer hunt. Okay. He said, okay, I want to take you deer hunting. And I was a kid, my dad hunted a lot. And my uncles hunted a lot, and my grandfather hunted a lot. I mean, everyone in my family, even my aunts would hunt. I mean, it was pretty, my sisters, I mean, it was pretty redneck, but that's, that's okay. I've got some rednecks in my family that go way back. They got the book and their pictures are in it, trust me. But they're awesome, awesome hunters. I mean, my aunt can shoot a gun as well as I can, and that's pretty cool. Uh, have an aunt teach you how to shoot a gun, that is awesome, let me tell you. But it, it was amazing, he said, I'm gonna take you hunting. So here we go, you know, seven years old. How many have ever taken a, a grandson or a son hunting? You know the story, right? Here you go up through the woods. And of course, I'm making more noise than my dad. He's like, you gotta be more quiet. Shh. You know, and we're walking through the woods and I'm like kicking rocks and, you know, banging sticks and doing all the stuff that kids do. But we get up into the woods and we're sitting there and, and I'll never forget, we were kind of on a hill that was angled like this, like up to our left would be the would be the top part of the hill and the right would be the bottom. And we were like right in the middle of the woods and it was, we were behind this big log. It was about this big around and like tucked down behind it. And I was cold. I mean, I don't know about you, but at seven years old, eight years old, I got cold quick. And, and, and you know, I don't know about you. I don't sit still very long anyway. So you can imagine if you think I'm hyper now, you should have seen me when I was seven. It was like, I mean, I was like on steroids. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I probably had a Mountain Dew at the time. Everybody knows when you were growing up in the 1970s, everybody drank Mountain Dew, right? It, 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 was, it was amazing. But I would remember sitting there and I was making noise, kicking drops, moving stuff around. And my dad's like, shh, shh, watch, just watch. Look out through there and watch. Just be watching. We got, you know, a deer going to come up. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, two seconds later, I'm back, not paying attention. I'm still kicking it around and of course he's like, shh, just wait, listen, listen, listen. You'll hear it, you'll hear something. And I'm like, oh, whatever, you know. He's like, look, look around, look around, you'll see something. So finally, you know, the big moment happens, true story. I mean, I could, we heard this noise coming and it was like, wow, that's, what is that, a squirrel? You know, cause squirrels make a lot of noise for a little creature. But all of a sudden, 
I'm, you know, down behind this log and all of a sudden I see my dad pulling his gun up, looking around. All of a sudden I'm standing up like, where is it? Boom, this deer takes off like a lightning fast and all I could see was horns, okay? I mean, these big horns and pow, my dad shoots and he misses it. He's like, son, if you would have just been quiet, we would have gotten him. That's why when you hunt, I mean, he's trying to be nice, but the whole time he's thinking, I'm gonna kill this kid. You know, I'm thinking that the whole time. I mean, when we got home, he probably, that's what he told my mom. But it's amazing how I scared off this big buck. I mean, the prize we had been sitting there for hours waiting on was gone. Just like that, it was gone. It was gone. It was funny. I can't imagine what my dad had to deal with. But it was, it was it, seeing this happen, it was just amazing to me looking back on that. My dad was really trying to do what was right in my best interest. So what does this when does this happen or or when does Jesus return you know we we talked about in scripture when does you know when does he come back and we're waiting and watching for him when does that happen in Matthew 25 and 13 it says watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour which the son of man is coming you don't know neither do I know it says you don't know the hour. Can you imagine when, it was, when the parable Jesus was talking about, the parable of when the master comes back from the wedding, finds his servant waiting or watching? Can you imagine if, if, if I would have been the kid, you know, if I would have been paying attention more and been watching for this deer, you know, maybe I would have been a little more prepared and, and my dad would have been able to have shot this deer, you know, and, and I'm like, you know, as a kid, I felt bad, but I really didn't. But, you know, in our personal lives, can you imagine if we were watching for Jesus's return at all times? I remember my, you know, when I was really, really young, some people, the elderly in my church, who would always be telling me there was always one little lady or one little guy who'd be like, man, you need to be watching for Jesus's return. You need to be ready. He's going to come any minute. And then my mom uh, took over from there and she was like, son, you need to be living right because Jesus is going to come back someday. And that was, you know, I'm 46 now, that was probably when I was 10 years old. So, you know, 30 plus years. It's always good to rehearse in our memory and always good to hear the return of Jesus is going to happen. Because sometimes I feel like the devil tries to dilute everything that we believe and tries to mix it up and say, oh, that's just old school preaching. That's something that they did back in the day. You don't need to be, that's the fears and the doubt that, that comes along with him because he is trying to pollute everything out there He's trying to pollute everything he can, but he's not gonna pollute the gospel, amen? Because the gospel is gonna be preached and it's gonna penetrate every heart. It's biblical that that's going to happen. But if you go on and, and thinking about, we should not only be watching, we should be looking. You know, when I was we're talking about that hunting trip, my dad said, be looking, be watching, be look, be, always be looking for something, always be aware of your surroundings. Then he said to the disciples in verse in uh, Luke 17, 22 through 35, and I won't read all of it, but it says, the day will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and when you will not see it. And if you skip down uh, in verse 31, it says, and you can read the rest later, it says, in the day he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in the night there will be two men, one in bed, the one will be taken and the other one left in the field, or the other one will be left. Two women will be grinding together, and the one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in a field, and the one will be taken and the other one left. It is biblical. It is biblical that this is going to happen. So, you know, we sit back and we go, okay, well, why are we talking about it now? Because the church of today, it needs to hear the same thing that the church heard 2000 years ago. God has never changed. We as a society have changed. We as a, a, a nation have changed. We as a, as a world has changed, but God has never ever changed. Am I right, Jenny? When you go to the Philippines and you preach the gospel, it's the same gospel. It's the same God. It's the same spirit preaching and ministering to us. So why do we, why is it that the devil is wearing us out? Because he knows that the time is short. 
That's why it says, don't be worried because the time is coming when, you know, Jesus is going to return and the devil knows it. The devil sees, he knows the scripture. He knows it better than we know it. He was in heaven. He heard it. He saw it. He, he studied it. The devil knows that Jesus is lining, God is lining up the, the, the playing field. He's getting his house in order. And I'm telling you today, get your house where it needs to be. Get, get, be going out to your friends, going out to your, your family, teaching and telling them Jesus is is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. We were in our Sunday school lesson this morning, we were talking about how revi what the word revive means and how revival applies to us. And I told the students, I said, stand to your feet. Let's draw a circle around ourselves. And, and in this circle, you're standing. Now, everything inside of that circle, let it be revived. Uh, work, on that, work on reviving that part. Don't worry about everything outside the circle. Worry about reviving what's inside that single circle and revive that. And guess what will happen? Then the church will start to be revived because we as individuals are the church. It's not the, the building. I mean, we can, we can paint all the pictures and paint all the, you know, do every, all the lights, everything we want. But until the church comes alive as individuals, that's when we're truly going to see a revival, so to speak, throughout the nation and throughout our country, throughout our community is when we start to revive as individuals. Anybody say amen to that? As we individually. If you were to looking, if I would have been looking instead of playing around on the ground, my dad would have gotten the prize. My dad would have gotten this, this deer and I can hear him now if, if I give him a copy of this sermon and I tell it, he'll be like, yeah, I can remember that. He, he's told that story. But if I would have been looking instead of, you know, if I would have been paying attention because there's gonna be people that you run into, there's gonna be people that you know. There's gonna be people that, you, that may be in your family if they're not looking and they're not watching that Jesus could return like that instantly and they could be lost for eternity. And let me tell you, this needs to, to tell us that, you know, hey, let me tell you what starts happening. We start getting all fidgety, we start getting nervous, you know, because God is the one speaking into our hearts. There is a time and there is a season, there is a place and Jesus, I mean, only God knows when that is, when he is going to send his son. What time of the day does this happen? Does anybody know in scripture where it says that? It says in Matthew, it says, therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. You don't know. So don't, if someone's telling you, I know exactly when Jesus is coming, I've got it predicted and here's the day it's going to happen. Don't believe them because they don't know. They're not in heaven standing, they're not God. When they tell me that, I'm like, how do you know that? You know, I'm like, I see, sometimes I see these predictions going on. How many can remember that someone said when the, was it in 2000 when the, when the change, everybody thought the world was gonna blow up or everybody was gonna, and, and remember that moment, everybody remember that moment of like one second afterwards, like, yeah, it didn't happen. It, it was like, we knew they were wrong. All the Christians like, yeah, we got them. We knew we were right. But it's amazing how people make these predictions. No one knows. It could happen as we're sitting right here, right now. Bang, just like that, Jesus could return. That's how severe, that's how, how, you know, we need to be getting the word out that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. If you ask God into your heart and he forgives you, he will immediately forgive you of his sins, you of your sins, not his sins, your sins, and you will be saved. Can you imagine if we all went out today and led one person to the Lord? One person, let's say everybody in this church went out and led one person to the Lord this year. And we like started supporting that person and started seeing them, you know, study the word. And we've all been there. We've all seen it happen. We've seen people come. We've seen people go, but you know, they're a soul. That is an eternal soul. Every single person you know is an eternal soul and Jesus Christ loves them all. Even the ISIS, the meanest ISIS guy, the most fierce soldier in the ISIS army, Jesus Christ loves that soul. Jesus, it is hard for some of us to grasp that. Even the biggest mass murderer who ever lived, who is on death row, Jesus Christ still loves that soul. He still longs for the day when he can reach out to that person and they can say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I am sorry for what I've done. And you know, instantaneously, even if you've done the worst vile thing in the world, Jesus Christ still loves you. 
That does not mean that if you're on death row that God is going, that, that you're automatically going to get off. But that does mean that your eternal heaven is waiting for you if you have received Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that we do not re- expect. And my last point is listening. Listening as the worship team would if you would come up and we prepare for the end of our, 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 our day today here at the church. Solomon was writing here in Proverbs and everybody that knows Solomon knows he was a wise man. So he wrote a lot of truths and a lot of wisdoms out in the Proverbs. And he said, now therefore, in Proverbs 8, 32 through 36, he said, now therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instructions and be wise and do not be disdain, dis, do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me watching daily at my gates, waiting for at the post of my doors for whoever finds me finds life and obtain favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul and those who hate me love death. If you were to, um, if we were to listen better, you know, if, if I were to have listened better to what my dad was telling me, if I would have listened maybe even more keener with my ears, if I would have been the guy, I would have gotten the prize. My dad would have gotten this prize and, and I was too busy playing around on the ground like a little kid always does. And I'm, I'm not meaning that little kids, it's hard. But if I would have been listening more, if I would have been paying attention, if I would have been in tune, how many of you know that sometimes God will speak and we hear it and we're like, okay, that was cool. And we leave, we go home from church and we're like, we don't even think about what God was saying. Sometimes we walk, we walk out of church after, and, and I believe in the, the body of believers coming together. I, I, I'm trying to be a pastor. I think that's probably up there on my chart of one of the things that I believe in. And one of the things I always, I always was taught as a young man, one of the things that I, I will stay with me forever, and parents and grandparents, you need to hear this. The fact that my parents drug me to church every single time the doors were open, even though I was the kid that said, I don't wanna go. I wanna stay home and watch football. But my mom was like, I don't care. You can read it in the paper tomorrow. And guess what it did? It made me more knowledgeable about sports because I did read it the next day and I read statistics and guess what? I'm a numbers guy. I'm a statistics guy. I don't look at plays. I look at statistics and that has helped me in my walk. And I know that sounds crazy. I know that sounds like, oh, he's just out and out of control. He's just hyper and talking about it. I'm telling you, one of the things that made me is when my mom would drag me to church is I would read. I would read more. I would read the newspaper. I would read Sports Illustrated, not the, not the February version. Don't worry, she would never give me that version. And those of you who are laughing know what I'm talking about. All the guys are, no, I'm just kidding. How fast will this happen? How fast will this happen? In 1 Corinthians, it says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible and we shall be changed. You will instantaneously be changed. Can you imagine? I will no longer be ugly. I will be hot, okay? I will be like, God, Jesus will look at me and say, man, you're a whole lot better looking. But we'll be changed instantaneously. So what is it? What do I need to do to be ready? What does it say? In Acts 2.21, it says, this shall come to pass. Therefore, or there whoever, uh, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When Peter was preaching, 3,000 people heard that message and they came to know the Lord. 3,000 people in one sermon. Can you imagine if you were the guy at work and says, all you gotta do to get out of that mess is be saved. All you gotta do, if you wanna see change in the workplace, you wanna see is start preaching the word of God. Start pre- Even though your friends are gonna be like, some of them are gonna reject it. There's a guy, he texts, his, he texts me every Sunday, every Sunday at nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, my phone dings and it's a message from this guy. I love him as a brother in the Lord. His name is Donnie Dean. Remember that name. No one would ever know. No one would ever know this guy was a, uh, because he's not a guy that shoves it up and says, here, eat it. He's, pre- he's, he's always speaking Jesus. When I would be r- running in sin, he would say, Trevor, you know, that's not right. That's sin. Tre- Trevor, don't, you don't need to be going out to those places. Trevor, don't, don't talk like that. Here's what the Bible says. 
And he started telling me that. And every Sunday, he's still to this day when I see him. One night I got the opportunity to preach or to speak over at Page County with, the, with our worship team. And he was there and I said, Donnie, thank you for bringing that person at the workplace who spoke Jesus. You're the one who spoke Jesus into my life. Now I know right now as the Holy Spirit's ministering, everyone here knows, you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus. As we come to a close here, I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to start thinking of that day. One, when Jesus returns to meet you face to face. And number two, think of that person you know. Think of that single person you know that doesn't know Jesus. There are people that you pass every single day at Walmart, you pass them at work, you pass them in the halls of your school, you pass them at wherever you work. At school. If you're a teacher, there are students that do not know Jesus. In John, when you read uh, in four, verse 14, it says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In, me. in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there, you may be also. As we have our heads bowed, I want you even right now, you're here today and you'd say, Trevor, if Jesus returned right now, I would not make it into heaven. I feel like that sin has, has drugged me down. I, was, I once either knew the Lord or I've never received him into my heart. But today it makes sense that Jesus is going to return someday. And I wanna meet him face to face. If you wanna meet him right now, I want you to stand to your feet and be bold and walk up to the front of this altar and kneel down and ask Jesus into your heart. You talk about a bold statement. You talk about a bold move. You talk about Jesus Christ putting his hand upon you and giving you a newfound life. If there's someone, even, even if, if it's being videotaped, if there's someone that's listening that would need to receive Jesus into your heart, ask him right now. Call upon his name and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I believe you are the son of God and you will be saved. If that's you right now, I just want you to, don't be bashful. I feel like God is ministering to someone here today. I don't want you to miss this moment in your life. You can say, brother, I've done it before. I just can't do it because I've been there. There's been times when Pastor Jeff will ask us to raise our hands for something. And I'll know that it's God's telling me to do it and I won't. And then I feel terrible because I didn't raise my hand. I feel like I failed God. Well, you're not failing God. Jesus wants to meet you right here. Is there anyone that I'm just give you one more plea. Is there anyone that would walk down to this altar and give your heart to the Lord? I need a couple Christian ladies that would come meet with my sister even right now and put your hand up on her back. You can kneel down right there, young lady. I need some Christian men who will come up and stand with these folks. Jesus loves them. I want you both to know Jesus Christ loves you. He's got his hand in heaven right now. The angels of heaven are standing up in heavenly choir. Is there anybody else you would say, I, I need to know, I need to know the Lord. I'm someone who, who I just need to know the Lord. I want you to just slip out of your chair and walk down here. God loves you. Secondly, I want you to, my second plea is this. When you go out today, I want you to put, put this message into your heart and say, Lord, I know you're going to return. My eyes and my focus is on you, Lord. And the things of this world, God, that, that are dragging me down, Lord, I'm going to, to the little petty things that are holding me back, the things that are, are keeping me from meeting you one-on-one -on, -one on a daily basis, I'm gonna purge them out of my life. When I, when I first got saved, one of the things I, I really struggled with, I could cuss with the best of them. And I said, Lord, please help me. Please help me. Please help me, Lord. I need wisdom in this. And now when I hear curse words, it's a turnoff because of the things in the faithfulness of God. So if you're here today and you'd say, there's a struggle that I'm having with my relationship with the Lord, 
You don't have to confess it to me. I want you to confess it to God even right now. I want you to just cry out to a Lord, to God. I think it's even fitting even right now, if everyone would just, just stand to our feet, our feet. And as the worship team comes and leads us in a song, as we close out tonight or today, I want you to leave this place knowing that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming to receive his church. Glory to God in the highest. He is amazing. We're gonna stand before him. Isn't it gonna be a glorious day? We should be shouting the roof off this place because Jesus is going to return. And where he is, we will be also, amen? Our worship team, Victoria, she's gonna lead us as we close. I just pray over you this morning that God would just lead you into a new place. Just lead you into a new place. If there's a coworker that needs, needs talk to, I pray that God give you the wisdom and the strength and the Holy Spirit use you to touch that person's soul. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord as, as Victoria leads us.